In this demo, we're programming a Swiss part on a Citizen L-Series machine using a Spree Edge. We'll walk through the setup, tooling, and automation, all focused on getting tool pass ready fast. If you're looking to reduce programming time without giving up control, this is a solid example of what a Spree Edge can do. Let's jump in. Let's start in the machine view. What you're seeing here is the digital twin of our Citizen L20. This isn't just a generic Swiss layout, it's built specifically for the L20 with all the axes, tooling positions, and channel structure matched to the actual machine. So when we simulate a part, we're seeing exactly how it will run on the floor. Next, I'll jump over to the tooling tab. You'll notice we've already got a full set of tools preloaded into the template. These are positioned based on the L20's gang plate and turret layout. So we're not starting from scratch every time. It's a huge time saver and helps avoid setup mistakes. Now let's add a mounting block. This is a brand new feature introduced with the first commercial release of Swiss in Esprit Edge, and it's designed specifically for Swiss style machines. Mounting blocks give us the flexibility to define exactly how tools are mounted, whether it's a gang plate, a live tool station, or a static holder. For this demo, I'm dropping in a B axis live tool with three stations onto position 11. This kind of setup is pretty common on the L20. And with mounting blocks, it's super easy to configure it just like it's mounted on the machine. Once it's in place, I can assign tools to each station directly. No guesswork, no manual offsets. It's all built to reflect how things are actually set up on the floor. So now that the block's in place and the tools are assigned, what we've built here is a digital setup that mirrors exactly how things are configured on the floor. But the real advantage is how reusable this is. Mounting blocks aren't just a one-time setup. They're part of a growing library you can pull from for future jobs. That means less time spent pre-programming and more consistency across your parts. Now that the tooling set, let's bring in the part. I'll start by importing the solid model, which loads the geometry into our workspace. From here, we'll go into part setup and define the part by selecting the model and pressing OK. Next, we'll add the stock. Since we're working from bar, I'll set it to 20 millimeter diameter and 200 millimeter length. I'm also adding a one millimeter facing offset to give us some clearance at the front of the part. Once that's defined, we hit okay, and now the part and stock are ready to go. With the part and stock defined, we're ready to move into machine setup. I'll open the setup dialog and assign the workpiece to the main spindle collet. A spree edge automatically adjusts the Z position based on the needed spindle stroke which saves time and helps avoid alignment issues. If needed, I can manually override the position to fine tune the parts location, especially important on Swiss machines where precise alignment with the guide bushing is critical. With the machine setup complete, we've now got a fully defined part, stock, and spindle configuration, all aligned and ready to go. This streamlined setup process not only saves time, but it also reduces the chances of error, especially in high mix Swiss environments. It's fast, reliable, and sets itself for efficient, accurate programming moving forward. Now that we've imported the CAD model and defined our machine setup, we're moving on to the next step of the CAD feature operation workflow. This is where we define the machining features that drive the tool pass. We'll start by creating turning features. I'll select the geometry, define the axis, and set a few parameters to capture the profile we want to machine. Next, I'll jump into the Feature Manager tab, where you'll see that a spree edge has automatically created all the turning features based on the part geometry. That means we're not manually sketching profiles. It's already done for us, which saves time and reduces setup errors. Next, we're going to create whole features. I'll go to the Features tab, select Hole, and choose the faces I want a spree to recognize holes from. Then I'll set Reconditioning Group and Parameters and hit OK. You'll see the results populate in the Features Manager, making it easy to review and organize. Alternatively, I could select the entire part and let a spree automatically recognize all the features on the model. That's a great option for more complex parts or when you want to speed things up. Now let's move to the milling features. I'll start by selecting a work plane that's normal to the tool axis. This tells us free how to rotate the part for milling. Then I'll select the slot face and create wall feature. 
It's a quick process and it gives us clean and well-defined geometry to work with. To finish up, I'll mirror the features to the opposite side of the part by rotating them 180 degrees around the center line. This keeps the setup symmetrical and saves time when programming both ends. With our turning, hole, and milling features defined, we've built a solid foundation for programming. This step brings consistency to the workflow, reduces manual effort, and sets us up for automation in the next phase. It's fast, repeatable, ensures that every operation we create is based on clean, well-structured geometry. With our features defined, we're ready to start building out the operations. I'll apply a process file to streamline the setup. These process files are pre-configured templates that include common operations. So instead of programming each one from scratch, we can apply them in sequence and customize as needed. We'll start with the facing operation to clean up the front of the bar. Then we move into OD turning along the front section of the part. After that, we'll apply a back turning operation to clean up the flange face towards the front. Next is grooving, cutting reliefs near the front of the part. These grooves are part of the design and serve a functional purpose in the final geometry. By applying the grooving operation, we're machining those areas with precision, following the exact contours defined earlier. Once that's complete, we'll move into another OD turning pass. This operation roughs and finishes the middle section of the part, continuing the sequence we started earlier. It's a streamlined approach, each operation builds on the last and the process file helps us apply them efficiently. From there, we'll apply a process that includes a sequence of operations, angled spot drilling, followed by drilling and tapping. Grouping these together in a single process keeps things organized and ensures they're applied in the correct order. It's a clean, efficient way to build out related operations without having to add each one manually. Next, we'll move into cross milling to machine the slot. Then we'll follow up with cross drilling to create the holes on the side of the part. Both of these are multi-axis moves, and thanks to the feature-based setup, the tools are automatically aligned with the geometry. After that, we'll add additional grooves towards the back of the part, followed by a second back turning pass to clean up the rear features. This final pass completes the part and sets it up for cutoff. Each of these operations is driven by the features we defined earlier, so the tool paths are automatically aligned with the geometry. That means less manual tweaking, faster programming, and consistent results across the entire part. Now let's run the simulation for the main spindle operations. This gives us a clear, real-time view of how the part will be machined, tool by tool, move by move. Each operation plays out exactly as programmed, and because the simulation matches the machine's kinematics, we're seeing true-to-life motion across axes and spindles. It's not just visual confirmation, it's a critical step for verifying toolpaths, checking clearances, and ensuring everything runs smoothly before we hit the shop floor. From facing to grooving, drilling, milling, and back turning, every move is aligned with geometry and synced for efficient execution. To prepare for the handoff, we begin by parking the cutoff tool so it's staged and ready. Then we add the pickup operation to channel two. As soon as that's in place, a spree edge automatically inserts the sink between channels. No manual input required. This is one of the built-in automation tools that simplifies multi-channel programming. We follow that with the cutoff operation. And just like that, the transfer between spindles is handled automatically in the program manager. It's a streamlined process that keeps everything coordinated and ready for simulation. With the pickup, cutoff, and sink in place, our transfer sequence is complete and fully coordinated. To take things further, we're going to introduce a new capability unique to Esprit Edge for Swiss machines, machining patterns. These patterns enable simultaneous and superimposed operations, allowing us to program more advanced parallel machining strategies with minimal effort. I'll apply our first pattern by modifying the sync move just before the transfer. 
This tells the software to coordinate the pickup and cut off operations to run in parallel, reducing cycle time while keeping everything in sync. Let's take a look at the simulation starting from the park operation. The cutoff tool moves into position and parks, ready for use. The subspindle then moves in for the pickup, followed by the cutoff operation. These moves are coordinated through sync logic and enhanced by the machining pattern we applied earlier. Once the part is cut off, the transfer to the subspindle happens automatically. Clean, efficient, and fully synchronized. With the part transferred to the subspindle, we'll begin by creating the remaining features on the back side. First, I'll define a milling profile to capture the outer contour. Then I'll run hole recognition to identify the holes on the back face. These features will serve as the foundation for the operations we'll apply next, using the same process-driven approach we used on the main spindle. With the features on the backside now defined, we'll continue just as we did on the main spindle, by applying process files to drive the machining operations. As soon as we apply the first process after the transfer, you'll notice that the link moves in channel 2 turn red. This signals that a machining pattern is missing, a common step when transitioning between spindles. To resolve this, we'll simply apply the appropriate machining pattern. This validates the link moves and ensures the machining logic is correctly interpreted for the sub-spindle. With the links resolved, we're ready to add finishing operations, in this case, chamfering and drilling. These are automatically sequenced and placed in the correct channel, respecting the multi-channel structure of the machine. This process-driven approach ensures consistency across both spindles and eliminates the need for manual sequencing or channel assignments. It's a streamlined workflow that saves time, reduces error, and gives you full control over how the part is machined. Now that everything is in place, Let's move into the full simulation to see the complete process in action. As the simulation wraps up, we've seen how Esprit Edge handles multi-channel machining with precision and control. But there's still room to improve, especially when it comes to cycle time and spindle utilization. In this next step, we'll shift our focus to optimization, unlocking concurrent machining and streamlining the production flow. Up to this point, the program has been running sequentially, machining on one spindle at a time. While this works, it doesn't take full advantage of the machine's capabilities. To unlock concurrent machining, we'll start by creating a release operation. This step is required to enable production mode, which allows both spindles to run in parallel. Once the release is in place, we'll switch to production mode. This automatically reorders the timeline, moving channel 2 operations to the top to prioritize simultaneous execution. From there, we can manually drag channel 1 operations to align with channel 2 fine-tuning the overlap and optimizing the workflow. This gives us full control over how and when each spindle is engaged, allowing us to balance the workload and reduce idle time. It's a simple but powerful way to boost efficiency and get the most out of your machine. With optimization complete, both spindles are now running in parallel. Channel 1 and Channel 2 execute simultaneously, with operations carefully synchronized to minimize the idle time and maximize overlap. As the simulation plays out, you'll see how Esprit Edge coordinates multi-channel machining with precision, maintaining smooth transitions and avoiding conflicts between tool paths. This level of control allows us to fine-tune timing, balance the workload, and ensure both spindles stay active throughout the cycle. The result is a streamlined program that reduces cycle time, boosts throughput, and makes full use of the machine's capabilities. Now that the program is complete and fully optimized, we'll post the NC code. The output opens directly in the NC editor, where we can review the results for both channel 1 and channel 2. Each channel is clearly separated, with clean, structured code that's ready to run on the machine. 
As we scroll through the output, you'll notice there's no need for manual edits. The post processor is tailored specifically to this machine configuration, ensuring accurate formatting, correct codes, and proper channel synchronization. This level of automation eliminates guesswork and reduces the risk of errors at the machine, giving you confidence that what you see in simulation is exactly what you'll get on the shop floor. That's a quick look at Swiss programming in a spree edge. If you found this helpful, go ahead and like the video, subscribe for more demos, or drop a comment below. Thanks for watching.